So today we're going to talk about fellowship, and fellowship is this idea that you are with people who are imperfect all around you. Look around for real quick. Look around real quick. If you need to remind them they're imperfect, feel free to tell them. Uh, but the truth is, we are around imperfect people, but here's the thing. We are, my son gave me this a few years ago, and I still have it. This is, if you've never seen it, this is a band made of parachute cord. And so last night I mentioned this, and you talk about the parts of the body, and I just said, Gene, do you know how much, uh, uh, how much this can hold? And I said, probably like 300, 800 pounds or something like that. Gene looked it up, sent me a text last night, 3,000 pounds is the tensile, is that how you say it, tensile strength? And uh, so amazing. So why is that? Because it's not just one rope. This was the, the cord used for parachutes in World War II, and it's not just one cord. If you'll notice, it is weaved and wound together. And the idea is that you carry this, and then if you have some kind of emergency where you need rope or string, you've got it with you. I don't know, maybe you have a tent emergency. I don't know what kind of emergency, but it was the thought of my son giving me this, so I've kept it with me all the time. But this is the idea of fellowship with each other. It's the idea that together, even in your brokenness, even in your imperfection, even in your messed upness, that together as we grow, we help each other to grow. Some of us are gifted in some things. Some of us are really good organizers. Some of us are the opposite of that, right? And so what? So we need each other. And as we look at this idea of fellowship, we're going to talk about and look mainly at Acts chapter 2. But I want to say this first. It was so great to get away. We had, Krista and I had a wonderful time, 50th birthday. Steve spoke last week. I attended church, I haven't been able to attend church in a long time. And so it was great. And so I appreciate uh, Pastor Steve and Rodney. Rodney is actually with his mom, who's very sick. She's 90 something years old. And so he's up with, in Atlanta with her, so you can be praying for them. But I so appreciate Pastor Steve and, Pastor, and, and Rodney. So I want to encourage you, tell them thank you. Tell them thanks for doing that. It makes it easy on me, and it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. So, so here's the thing about life sometimes is life, if we're not careful, is not very stable. And if you haven't noticed, you'll go through crisis, and you'll go through change, and you'll go through difficulties. But one of the things about having friends, people who you've known, who've been a part of your life, fellowship with other people, is that it's kind of a shock cord. Those people can be there for you when you're hurting, when you're going through difficult times. There are people in here that I have been with, have been part of my life for 25 or more years who have seen and been there when we've gone through hard times, and we've been there when they've gone through hard times, and it helps us to survive these different stages that we all deal with in life. And listen, one of the things I love, there's just some wonderful stories about people, but if we're honest, we all have a few stories where people aren't as wonderful, right? So I can remember going on a DC trip years ago and the, uh, when Danielle was in junior high, that tells you how long ago it was, and the principal took off uh, because we had an emergency. The principal took off. He had this huge folder. We're in Washington, D.C. There's about 70 people, uh, 30 or 35 students and their parents. He hands me the notebook and says, you're in charge and walks off. So I looked down at the notebook. As I'm starting to look through the notebook, the adults and the kids are standing in front of me. I hear some of the adults saying, well, he doesn't know how to lead. And I'm reading it, and I go, huh. I close the book, and I said, would one of you like to lead? It was amazing how quickly they did not want to lead. And we're suddenly enjoying my... 20-something-year-old leadership, right? Now, the truth is, I'm thankful that none of them actually knew their way around because one of them might have said, I can lead this thing, and, you know, we would have been in a ditch somewhere. But anyway, so, so the truth is, when you do something, when you step out, there are people who will complain. Some of you have been hurt by church people. But let me encourage you. Don't let what has happened, what has hurt you, something that went wrong in a relationship, don't let that keep you from having fellowship and 
connection with other people. Because here's the thing. The truth is, when you're involved in church, you're less likely to complain about church. Um, most of you know that Mandisa passed away this weekend. One thing that people, a lot of people don't know is when they, she was on that TV show where they criticize all the singers, uh, Simon Cowell looked at her and told her she was fat. Don't you want to punch him in the face now? Don't you? But, but it, it was very hurtful and very painful time in her life. And yet God used that to help make her who she was. It doesn't mean he's not a jerk. And the truth is there's some people in your life that even the jerky things they've done, even the hurtful things they've done, God can even use that. If for no other reason to say, don't be like that. You know, people sometimes read the Old Testament and they go, I read this story about this guy. What is that about? I go, that's called a non-example. Don't do what that guy did. And so sometimes in our lives, what, those situations that have happened, God, if nothing else, can use that hurt to show us, you know what? Be kind to people. Be graceful to people. Be loving towards people. So today I want to talk about don't go to church, be the church. And we're going to talk about studying the word together, helping each other, and praising God and joining in fellowship. So number one, study the word together. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, just a few verses today. And then I'm going to bring some other verses in for support. There's tons of scriptures about fellowship. I'll mention some of them in passing, but we're going to stick primarily with Acts chapter 2. Number one, study the word together. Acts 2, 42, 43, the very first church, here it is. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What do we call the apostles' teaching? We call that the Bible now, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, I've got to tell you this real quick. This word fellowship is koinonia. We, we use the word fellowship because in English, there's not a good word that means exactly what koinonia means. It's more than just Fellowship, it's more than just shaking hands or eating with each other. It basically means sharing life. It's a deep sharing. It's beyond how we would explain it. If you have the Amplified Bible, it probably is four sentences long right there because the idea of fellowship is so much deeper in that word koinonia. So think more of koinonia being something like this, where you're sharing life, you're, you're woven with other people so that when you fall down, they pull you up. When they fall down, you pull them up. When they're hurting, you're there to pull them back. And yes, they're broken and messed up. And so it, it, here's the deal. So it says the, the teaching and the fellowship, and then it says to the breaking of bread and prayer. So that's not only eating together, it's also talking about the Lord's Supper. Everyone was filled with awe. And this word awe is really cool too. It's the same word as when the disciples saw Jesus walking on water and they freaked out. <laughs> they were like, oh, that's unbelievable. It's phobia. It's where we get the word phobia. It's like fear. And so it's like the people saw what God was doing and it was, wow, look at that. Just, just an overwhelming. Like if you, if you all of a sudden saw something you've never seen, you're like, wow. That's amazing. Jen and I were driving last night to the baptism, and on the way there, there's a little lake, there's a little dock, and there's an American flag. And on that dock last night was this huge bald eagle. And Jenna about lost her mind. She said, that's the most American thing I've ever seen in my life. And so I had to pull down someone's driveway who thankfully did not kill me to get a picture, a very bad picture, of the bald eagle on somebody's thing. And so this is the idea. Everyone was filled with awe. It's like they saw something they've never seen before. We're like, whoa! And then it continues. As the many, at the many wonders and signs of performed by the apostles. So what were they doing? They were having church services. They were having small groups. They were having both the large groups and small groups. They were studying the Bible together. They were fellowshipping together. They were having the Lord's Supper together. They were eating together. They were praying together. I mean, that's the early church. That's what they did. They weren't just talking about church. They weren't just sideline reporters sitting back and going, well, that back, you know, this big fat guy writing an article going, well, that linebacker needs to lose some weight. And you're like, well, Right? And so the truth is they were doing church, not just talking about church. It wasn't just a study of psychology. It wasn't a self-help. It was about the kingdom. By the way, this is something, if you ever leave our church, or if you're, this isn't your home church, I, I want you to pay attention because here's the deal. 
Sermons should help you. Absolutely. That's what God uses these messages to help you. But the true focus is God's kingdom, not our self-improvement. And so a sermon is not meant to point towards us. It's supposed to point towards Jesus. So we look at God's word and we say, how can my life be more like the kingdom? And so hopefully every week it does help you and it does self-help you, but that's not the focus. The focus is God's kingdom, not myself. And in a selfish, self-centered world that has selfish gravity, we have to always go back and say, what does God's word say about that? Pull me towards God's kingdom, not my kingdom. Romans 15, Paul says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. How many of you would like to be full of all joy? Anybody in here like that? Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? I mean, you ever get depressed for no reason? Uh, we have a sick dog at the house who, who may not make it this week. And it's amazing how you can go from, wow, what a great night to, oh no. Right? You had one of those moments? And we all have them. And, and, and they go in life. And yet, Paul says to the early church, you can be full of all joy. By the way, all joy is not church lady joy. That's Botox and medication. Right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about joy on the inside, even when life is hard, even when life is difficult. By the way, there's some days that all you can say is, well, some glad morning, I'll fly away. I mean, that's your best line, right? You got joy, not because of what's happening, but because what you know God has done for you. And then it continues, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. That'd be awesome too, right? As you, what? trust in him. God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. I don't know the picture. I don't know the answers, but I trust you. And then it continues. Trust in him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's where the power comes from. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge. Now listen to what he says to the early church. And competent to instruct one another. So what? This is part of what we're supposed to do as believers is instruct, help each other. Yet I have written you boldly on some points to remind you of them again. Why? Because the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. Why? So the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so Paul not only talks about the early church and says, I want you to see the joy of Christ, but the reason I do all this is to help people to find their way home. That's what we say in our church. We're, we're trying to help people to find their way home. I talked to a lady this week who's dying. And she was talking about some concerns in her family. And I said, you know what? I'll do everything I can to help that family member to find their way home. If there's anything that I can do or be a part of or God can use. And I'm praying that they would find their way home. And you should have seen the look of joy in the middle of struggle in the hospital. And the truth for all of us is, am I going to help people find the way home? By the way, one of the things as you instruct one another, we don't always like to be instructed. Yesterday I was working with my HOA and I was pressure cleaning a wall. And all of a sudden I saw a couple people walking up behind me and I thought, oh no. But you got to realize I've been a pastor a long time. So I stopped the thing, turned out my headphones. I said, hey, how's it look? Knowing... They said, it looks great. And I went, oh. And they said, but don't pressure clean that rock. I said, why not? They said, because it'll ruin it. I said, I already pressure cleaned it. <laughs> I didn't know that. So here's the deal about instruction. I don't like to be corrected, do you? Anybody here love that, right? No? But, but the truth is, I didn't know what she was talking about. And she said, well, the good news is, you didn't ruin it. I said, yeah, that's really good. Because I didn't know that. I said, because I was... <laughs> love pressure washer, man. I just... <laughs> don't accidentally hit your foot would be the only thing. So, but what happened? They came, and I understand that it's easy to stand on the sideline and criti criticize people. And it's easy to be here in this position and go, 
what do you, who do you think you are? I'm actually doing something. But the truth is, God may use one of these sideline reporters to grow you. So don't be so quick to say, I don't need instruction from anybody. Or you're not doing what I'm doing, so you don't know what you're doing. Listen, you pay attention. Now, some people will tell you something that you need to go, yeah, thanks a lot, and realize, I don't do that. But then there's other people that you say, that has wisdom. And that's why the Bible says that we need discernment to hang on to the things of God. You know, one of the things my senior year when I first became a Christian that happened was my youth pastor gave me a book that looked like a coloring book, but it went through 1 John. And he said, I got five junior hires. I want you to meet with them every Sunday. And I went, and do what? And he said, you're going to go through this book. And you're going to talk to them about it. I literally had no idea what I was doing. But I would go in. I would read the book ahead of time. I would go in and I'd go, okay, read this passage. And they'd read the passage. And then I'd say, question number one. By the way, this is exactly what my small group looks like today. Just like that. Right? Read this passage. Question two. That's, I mean, it really is. And so the truth is that... <laughs> the truth is... <laughs> I don't blame them. I'm tired of this too. And so I taught this first group of people. And what did it do? It said, oh my goodness, great. They're hungry. I, that's, that's hunger. I know that sound. I make that sound every morning. Sorry. I'm sorry, Rand. You're trying. They're trying. It's so hard with the babies. You know, you're trying. And, but we love you. And we're so glad you're here. So, so here's the thing. So I went from that. And then when I went to college... I went and helped with a youth group. And what did I do? I discipled a few kids. I'd go in and meet kids and play basketball. It's the reason I started watching basketball. So I had something to talk to these kids about. They loved Michael Jordan. So we'd talk about Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was an NBA player. Sorry. He's still in video games, so they're good. One of the things I did then a few years later was I had a men's group that we would meet with once a week. And, and once a week we'd meet, we'd go to Pops Casbah down in, in Melbourne, and we'd do something called SOAP. And SOAP stood for Scripture, Outreach, Accountability, and Prayer. And what we do? we talk about Scripture. we talk about who we're reaching out to. we talk about accountability, how you're treating people, what's going on in your life. And then we'd pray for each other. Now, this is, almost, this is probably 30 years ago. On Friday, I got a text from one of those guys saying, Hey, I'm just checking in on you. Doing okay? We need to get to lunch for lunch soon. Almost 30 years later. And so there's these people in your life that if you find the right people that you can talk to. One of the things, I had a lady come up to me this week. She said, my husband needs somebody to talk to. I go, tell me what that means. Like, do you need him to come see me? Are we dealing with... She goes, no, no, no. He just, he just kind of sits around. He's got to go make some friends. And I said, ha, ha, ha. That's why we have a men's breakfast. And so I looked at her husband. I said, we have a men's breakfast every Wednesday. I said, I come to about a third of the time. I said, every Wednesday morning, Kay's barbecue, 7.30 in the morning. And he can eat and doesn't have to say a word if he doesn't want to. Or he can share or ask people to pray for him, whatever he wants. That's all I said. And he asked me questions about it. Where is it at? And I always know that when somebody says, where is it at? That means they actually heard and cared. If you, by the way, a smart thing to do is don't tell them where you're meeting and see what happens. See if they even ask, because then you're like, well, they're not coming. Why aren't they coming? Because they don't know where it is. And they didn't ask. Now, why do we do that? Because we all need a place to connect. By the way, women, you're much better at this than we are. Guys, we're terrible at it. And so we've got to go out of the way. You've got to go out of your way to connect with other people. And I don't care how you do it. Go out of your way to connect with other people. Number two, we help each other. We help each other. Helping people is a pain. Did you know that? When you're pressure cleaning a wall and somebody comes and says, I got a correction for you. We're like, who do you think you are, right? Because we tend to bow up, right? We tend to get our pride in the way. But the truth is, when you hang around people, you ready? People can be petty. People can care about things that aren't a bit. They can make a big deal about things that don't matter. And I'm like, you people do that. And then God says, and so do you. <laughs> what do you mean, God? 
Eric, remember this week when you came out for in the morning to make your coffee and all the coffee stuff was done and you lost your mind? I do remember that. Yeah, that's petty. Oh. And remember when you decided that you were going to drive on 520 and you decided, you know what, I'm not in a hurry, I'm setting the speedometer, I'm going to go slow, no big deal, and then you saw somebody come flying past you in the left lane and then slow down and block all the cars next to you. And you thought, that person's an idiot. And you judged them and thought about everything they did wrong and thought how they should have learned how to drive and had a daddy like you that taught you not to drive in the left lane when you couldn't go faster. By the way, can we make a pledge today? I will not drive in the left lane slowly. Would you just? Okay. So I think that should be a requirement for new members at our church. But anyway, so, right, right? So what is that? You ready? You ready? That's petty. It doesn't matter. And yet sometimes I'm surprised at how frustrated I get about things that don't matter. So when somebody else gets frustrated with me and I think, look how petty and ridiculous they are, God goes, <clears throat> and you. So remember when somebody's petty, when they get upset about the wrong thing, when you think, oh, they've got a problem, remember, God, would you help me to give them grace? Now, I'm not talking about enabling people. I'm not talking about, you know, helping somebody who has major issues to continue to have major issues. Please don't hear me the wrong way. But we all get upset and freaked out about petty things. So we have to help each other. Let's give, let me give you some verses. In Acts 2, it goes in 44 and 45. This is probably the most misused verse, but we'll just do it real quick. As believers were together, they had everything in common. And here's what's cool too. This word for in common is koinos, which is taken from that root of koinonia that we talked about. And it means to share. So they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Now, a couple things I want you to notice. This is one of those verses that I would tell people, don't make a theology out of one verse. This verse is not saying to go home and sell everything you have and give it away. That's not what this verse is saying. And the truth is, if you look, it says they gave to everyone who had a need. And I will tell you that one of the hardest things sometimes to have good boundaries is to help people with needs and not help people with wants. That's a big, especially in America, that's, that's a difficulty because what's a need? Is internet a need or a want? You would say, oh, that's a want. You have kids that are in school. That's a need right? And so, and so it's, it's, it's not a clear-cut answer. The other thing is you never see this idea happen again, but you over and over in Scripture see people share with one another. When's the last time you shared with someone or helped somebody or, or gave some money to their GoFundMe or did something to go out of your way, what? To help somebody that had a need. So what did it look like when Jesus discipled people. You know, discipleship, that word means in the dust of the master. It means they followed Jesus around. So what did Jesus do? You ready? Jesus walked a lot. Jesus taught them and they ate together. Over and over, read the scripture, over and over those three things happen. What does that mean? It means they did life together and Jesus was there for them. And by the way, so many times Jesus would say something to them and he'd say, do you understand now? And they'd all go, uh-huh. And then later they'd go, what were you talking about? And so know that as we grow and we share with one another, it's not just possessions. It also has to do with your talents, your gifts, who you are. How do I know that? Because of what it says here in uh, Romans chapter 12, four through eight. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members don't have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And I love the idea that God has poured talents in your life and he has called you to take those talents, those gifts, and pour them into the lives of others. 
When we bought a house a few years ago, my small group came over and the house, <laughs> to make a long story short, the walls were uglier than these walls and needed to be painted. And my group said, hey, why don't we come over and have a painting party? I said, that sounds great. So they came over and we were all painting and then somebody walked over to me and said, Eric, give me that and took my brush away and said, you do anything except paint. You can bring water, you can scrape, you can mix, don't paint. Please don't paint ever again the rest of your life. Why? Because I am the worst painter in the world. ADD people should not hold paintbrushes ever, ever, maybe outdoors, but nowhere else. Because we get in a hurry, we start doing it and we think, ah, well, you know, it needs a little more paint. And then we load the thing up and drip it from wherever we were. And we think, ah, the paint thing's over there, I'll go over there and fill it up. I guess I'll clean that up later. And the truth is, none of us are talented in everything. But God gives you different gifts, why? To make you stronger. When you're weak in one area, you have a friend who's helping you along. And by the way, the house got painted beautifully. We had people in that group who could cut a corner in without tape. I never in my life have seen that. And yet I'm like, mm -hmm. there's paint all over me. What are you gifted in? Are you pouring that gift out on other people, that gift that God has given you? Here's some, some, some one another's of fellowship. Serve one another, confess to one another, accept one another, forgive one another, greet one another, bear one another's burdens, be devoted to one another, honor one another, teach one another, submit to one another, and encourage one another. Now listen, we have a couple of people who help usher and greet a couple of times a month who are going in the hospital for surgery. And so I would love it in this group if a couple of you guys could step up and say, you know what? I can greet once a month. You know what? I could pass the offering plate once a month. So if you'd be willing to do that, if you'd sign up on your way out, that would really help. Why do I say that? Because the truth is, when one person falls down, you know what friends do? They help them up. They walk with them. And so let's look for those opportunities. Number three, praise God and join in fellowship. This makes me think of Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are in jail. And the Bible says not only are they singing in this prison with a hole above them where everything from above comes down. <clears throat> not only are they singing, they're singing so loudly that the other prisoners are listening, the Bible says. The truth is, when you begin to praise God with your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're walking through, you know what happens? Other people start to think, what is that about? But the truth is also, as you get around people, people are imperfect. A pastor called me not too long ago, and here's my words to him. I think the first time I ever said it, it was to Neil. I said, I just want to let you know, I'm sorry about people. And the truth is, I'm sorry about people. And by the way, I'm also sorry about me sometimes, right? All of us have to recognize the people are not perfect, but yet God will use the people in your life to grow you. Listen to what it says in Acts 2, 46 and 47. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and doing what? enjoying the favor of all the people. And what happened? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Listen, when you start to live this life that most people, most people in our world do not live, where you recognize you need other people and just because they're not perfect, you don't reject them. Just because they're still working to get their act together, you don't say, well, well I don't want to hang around you. The truth is, as you get around these people, in their brokenness, in their fears, in their tears, and you allow God to use you to pour into their life, and guess what? They pour into your life. The world says, there's something different about you. When you praise the Lord, when you have the worst voice in the room, your friends will go, 
Wow, they're really sincere. Terrible, but sincere. And they'll say, there's something different about you. In Hebrews 10, what I said to the kids was, let us consider how we may spur. You've heard this verse three times today now. How we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And the truth is what Steve said is so true. So many people can get to the point that they get in a habit of not going to church. It happened in the first century. It happens today. But I want to encourage you. Get with one or two other people. Because the truth is, sometimes what we do here is just a little piece of church. And real church takes place when you look at somebody and you say, You too? You struggle with that too? Would you pray for me? And we need those people in our lives to encourage us and inspire us. I haven't told this story very often. But years ago when I was starting a church, we didn't have any funding. We didn't have any insurance. I had two children. Little did I know I had another one on the way. And I had a guy who was very wealthy come to me. And he sat, I can remember, he sat across the desk from me. And he said to me, listen, I got a group, and I think it was 15, of 15 multimillionaires who want to come to your church. And they're tithers. By the way, do the math, that's 100000 a year. Pastors know that. So he says this to me, and then he says, but we don't want to help with anything. We don't want to really get involved. We don't want to work or set up anything. We just want to come and show up. I looked him right in the face with no other sponsorship, with no idea how insurance would work out, with no idea what was going to happen next, and said to him, well, you guys probably don't want to come then because that's different than what we're doing as a church. Now, why did I do that? Because I'm crazy. No, the truth is, here's what I understand. That's not church. Church is not just showing up and sitting in a row and looking at somebody and saying, well, that was a great sermon today, Pastor. Church is about taking that time, that being a piece of it, but then taking that inspiration, that encouragement, and saying, God, how can I pour that into somebody else's life? And allowing somebody else who's imperfect, who's broken too, to pour into your life. I don't want us to just talk about church. I don't want us to just go to church. I want us to be the church, and so many of you are. That's why you reach out to the community. That's why you reach out to each other. That's why you're there for each other in hard times. I've seen it over and over. And if you're not a part of that, I want to encourage you, take that next step. Join a small group. Join a team. Join a group that you can be a part of. There's all kind of opportunities. That's what the bulletin's for. You find an opportunity every week and say, God, I want to take that next step. Why? So I can pour my life into others and so they can pour into my life. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. So you can come up. I'd love to talk to you about what it means that Jesus died and rose again. And that when we confess our sins, the Bible says he forgives us. And when we surrender our lives to him, we become disciples of Christ. So if you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. Wherever you're at on this Christian walk, I want to encourage you to take the next step on your journey. Don't stay where you're at. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that we wouldn't just come to church, but we would be the church. I thank you for a church where so many people do what they're called to do. So many people use their gifts. So many people look for opportunities to serve and love others. Father, help us to continue to be that way. I thank you, Lord, for the light in this community that so many of our folks are. So, Lord, help us to continue to help people find their way home as they see the difference that unity and love makes. Lord, we love you. Lord, I love all these people here. I pray they would know your love today. In Jesus' name.